I've got to mention that uh, um, one can buy a mug uh, down at the corner. It's called the Mo Mug. Um, and I think it, it has a very uh, famous illustration on the front. Um, I think there are three left if, if, you, if you need some. You can, you can order more, by the way. Um, so, um, as the final event of today, from the United Kingdom, we are happy to welcome Douglas Murray. Um, in spite of his um, young age, uh, Douglas has already made a name uh, for himself as one of Britain's preeminent conservative authors, critics, and commentators. From 2007 until 2011, he was uh, director of the Center for Social Cohesion. Um, they made a lot of, um, made a lot of good work and, and uh, some noted publications uh, on, on social issues in England or Britain. Um, he is currently co-director, I think, of the think tank, the Henry Jackson uh, Society. Um, I should also mention that uh, Douglas is one of the very few people alive who has been able to, to give that famous Islamic double talker, Tariq Ramadan, his come out uh, Thank you for that. <laughs> so without further ado, Douglas. Um, it's a great pleasure to be back. I was just mentioning to somebody actually that Doug and I debated each other so often now that I, I never know which debate anyone's talking about when they uh, mention our various encounters. But the last time we uh, met in London was a few months ago for a debate on these matters. And the, uh, I said at the opening, the chair, the chair said to me just before we went on, Are you not worried, Douglas? You and Tarek have spent so much time together now that you might be in danger of becoming friends. No, not at all. Um, um, but it's a great pleasure to be back uh, in Denmark, it's a great pleasure to be back in Hagen and with the uh, Free Press Society, who I follow closely uh, from England, and I say it's a great pleasure uh, to be with you. I should also open with a, uh, an apology, I'm not a lawyer, and um, sometimes in London it feels like I'm the only person who isn't a lawyer, but, but, but it, the point is that having heard Anne's fantastic uh, presentation uh, uh, earlier, I'm, I'm going to talk slightly away from some of the legal uh, uh, um, issues, but try to come around to, I think, making some similar points. Um, and the first thing is to say that, of course, there couldn't be a better time to discuss these issues, because uh, we, you, but we collectively in Europe are in a mess at the moment on this issue, uh, and I think it's a mess which matters and the untangling of the mess matters, because it could still go any way. Um, on the one hand, we've seen only in recent days the issue with uh, the uh, firebombing of uh, Charlie Hebdo, and the fallout from that. Once again, in the now familiar routine, even Time magazine, I think, just a couple of days ago, ran a piece basically saying why uh, Charlie Hebdo deserved to be burned down, and um, if anyone wants to take a crack at Time magazine now, they've made themselves open for it, because clearly if you disagree with something in a magazine, it's now simply expected as a matter of course that you'd, you don't write a letter to the editor uh, as in the bad old days. You, you, just did. you approach the office with a, with a, with a Molotov cocktail <laughs> and uh, have your say that way. <laughs> Um, and then on the other hand, of course, we also have uh, and uh, should consider the fact that there has been uh, a very significant debate now, which has also arisen from the massacre in Norway carried out by Breivik. These uh, twin things are worth mulling on because I think somewhere between them we can find uh, uh, the way that these pieces will eventually arrange themselves. Because... The mess that I, I, I referred to couldn't be uh, uh, um, couldn't be worse in some ways. I mean, you you heard already from Lars. You know all you, the case uh, of what uh, Lars went through here, and cases like the case of Wilders. 
And to my mind, uh, and I hope to yours, uh, if I'm not prejudging you, um, it doesn't matter whether people uh, declare guilty or declared innocent. The fact that they're in a court at all is an outrage from the start. That is the problem. I have no interest in innocent, uh, in non-guilty verdicts or guilty verdicts. It, it, it doesn't matter. The idea that people are in court for their opinions, and worst of all, in court uh, for explaining truths, is a madness of our time. Now, um, I hope I don't sound too Anglo-Saxon if I just remind the current uh, audience uh, of the, what I would say, are pretty English roots of the argument for freedom of expression, or at least the two best texts. Uh, the first being, uh, of course, Milton's uh, Areopagitica, the great uh, defense of a free printing press in particular, uh, which still bears rereading, I think, certainly by our legislators. And the second text I'd cite as well is uh, John Stuart Mill uh, on liberty, uh, written two centuries after Milton, but making many of the same arguments. And I would say that these arguments boil down to two things in particular. Mill cites four issues, but I hone them down to two. But basically, the importance of having as wide a remit as possible in free speech comes down to the fact that, firstly, you may need to hear opinions you do not want to hear because you yourself may be in error. And if you're not entirely in error, you may at least be partly in error. And you may need to be put back on a good course as well. And you may not be able to get back on a good course unless you can hear speech which some people may wish to deprive you of. And secondly, the other defense being that even if the opinion is wrong, it can do you no harm to hear it, because in the hearing of it, you will know the arguments against your position and in the process will be able to strengthen your own position. You will know better why you are right. You will know better why some things are true and some things are not. And you will be able to have a better armory to your own opinions. And I think this has to be borne in mind very carefully, because among other things at the moment, uh, uh, there are moves across Europe uh, to criminalize speech and criminalize writing, which is often filled with error. Let me give you one quick example. The uh, appalling Nazi apologist, so-called historian David Irving. Now, some people's responses is uh, to him and to his fake scholarship is to criminalize him, to put him in prison, and so on. And I think that's exactly the wrong way to deal with him. The right way to deal with him is to debate him, is to have other scholars of equal or, more importantly, greater stature able to pick apart his lies. But if you don't do that, you can be absolutely certain that a few years down the line, you will have a generation of people who, when they are confronted by an Irving, who has spent many, many years in archives and knows his 1930s and 1940s handwritten German very, very well, you can be sure that there will be a time in the future, if you have simply criminalized that and locked people in prison, that you will have a generation who says the Holocaust happened and, of course, it happened, and somebody else comes along and says, no, it didn't, and the people saying it did are not prepared. It happened because we have laws to say it happened. It happened because well, we know it happened, but you haven't been able yourself to enforce that argument. You have not encouraged other people to enforce that argument. And so we become weaker as a society. We become less able to explain our own history. We become less able to explain our own truth. Now, there is a reason, I would say, that we are in a particular mess, and it's a reason which um, uh, I think most of you will be aware of, which is that what is happening at the moment in Europe is not, a, um, is not an arbitrary uh, uh, process. It is a particularly political process going in a particularly political direction. There is effectively a political legal land grab. 
there are moves uh, in only one particular direction. Let me give you an example of why I and many other people have come to that conclusion. If an imam in London <laughs> says that, say, homosexuals are vermin and should be killed, very, very unlikely. In fact, we haven't had a case that that person would be tried, go to prison, or so on. But if uh, uh, Lars Hedegaard or a similar figure were to say this imam says this, he will be will be investigated for Islamophobia, possible hate crime, and so on. That is same the direction in which it goes. Let me give you one legal example alone from recent years. Uh, the case of Gert Wilders with Fitner. Now, in the case against Wilders, as I say, innocent or guilty is not of any uh, significance in these farcical proceedings. In the case of Wilders, the script of Fitner was put in as evidence in his trial. Uh, the script, as you will know, almost entirely consists of the rantings and ravings of various extremist Islamist scholars, religious leaders. Among them, Sheikh Yusuf al Karadawi. Now, Geert Wilders can end up in court having to defend himself against charges of inciting violence by producing a film in which Karadawi appears. But of Karadawi himself, not a problem. Not only not a problem, but worse than that. Uh, when Yusuf al Karadawi came to London under the uh, radical leftist mayor Ken Livingston, he was literally received with a red carpet. Bowings and scrapings and your honourness and everything laid on. Now, how can it be possible that Gert Wilders can end up in a courtroom for quoting Karadawi, but Karadawi is received on a red carpet for being Karadawi? These, these two things are not surely possible. If Karadawi calls uh, everyone in this room apes and pigs, and Geert Builder says that Karadawi has called everyone in this room apes and pigs, it should be Mr. Karadawi who is in trouble and not Geert Builders. Yet the system in Europe has got this exactly the wrong way around. And I think that we have to look at why that is. And it comes down to a moral motivation.